Hello and welcome back to Bright Onion Music Discussion. Today we're going to be discussing Boards of Canada. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of like our long-awaited uh, video, if you've been following our videos. I think we've mentioned at the end of every video that we're going to do Boards of Canada and we haven't yet. Mm -hmm. so and now, people have commented many times, do Boards of Canada. Please do Boards of Canada. Now do Boards of Canada. And now we got it. Yeah. <laughs> we actually did record a Boards of Canada video like a couple months ago. And we just didn't like it. So yeah. it was not very good. Yeah. But now here we have it. Okay. So who are Boards of Canada? Okay. Well, there are two. It's a band of two people. And they're electronic artists. And they're brothers. Yeah. And they're brothers. And uh, for a long time, they were kind of like anonymous. But they kind of like opened up. And um, yeah, knowledge about them became very well widespread. widespread. Yeah, widespread. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, anyway, so basically they're named after the National Film Board of Canada, which is like uh, back in the 70s. I, I, I don't know if it's still, it's still a thing, mm -hmm. but like back in like the 70s when they grew up, um, they had, you know, a lot of like nature documentaries and everything like that yeah. from Canada. Now, the band, Boys of Canada, aren't from Canada, they're from Scotland, but I guess they grew up watching these videos anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the music does really fit Canada. Yes. Like we were driving through Canada during this summer yeah. and uh, from like uh, Western Canada all the way to around Ontario mm -hmm. and they it really fit Canada like we listened to all the boards of Canada on, on the drives and uh, it was like amazing it fit so well so it was really good I mean some albums fit certain like provinces and areas mm -hmm. more than others uh, well we'll get into that later yep. but uh, first off now um, I guess we could go a little overview of their discography right yeah so they have a few EPs such as Tourism and Boards of Canada or Bach Maxima, <laughs> BOC Maxima, which is like a compilation of old material. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the first album was Music Has the Right to Children, which is the only album we have as of yet for Boards of Canada on vinyl. And that's also the one we're playing right now. Yeah, it's the one we're playing right now in the background. So, you know, very eerie pictures of people without faces. Yeah, it's very and nice. very turquoise tint. Which really fits the album because the whole album is very turquoise and uh, actually really chill. And there's a track called Turquoise Hexing Out Sun. Yeah, there is, yeah. Um, I think the reason why we don't really talk too much about album covers on this channel, and no, I think we, we should. Because um, I think that this is a very great album cover. Yeah. Because it really reflects the kind of like feelings and moods of the album. And the kind of eeriness of the. Because, like, there's an undertone, a dark undertone to all their synths. And I think this really pictures that very well. And there's a feeling of nostalgia that kind of permeates through their mm -hmm. music. All um, of their albums, yeah. Well, yeah. But especially, I'd say, this one. Mm -hmm. Especially. Uh, and I guess Campfire Headface. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, like, you can kind of see in the background, there's, like, um, there's, like, mountains, right? It's, like, mountainous territory, right? Yeah. So it's, like, people that are on some kind of, like, road trip, and they like, kind of went off the side of the, on the side of the road and took a picture, a family picture, from yeah. the mountains. It's very nice. The only eeriness is that it's is a faceless picture. That they all come, yeah, they all have no faces. So, uh, <laughs> none of the kids in the album artwork have faces. So it's almost like the feeling of the album is this kind of like nostalgia that they can't exactly put faces to. It's like they have like this like very, these this glimpses of their childhood that they yeah. really like and they remember fondly, but they can't, they're, they're all pretty fuzzy. And that's really their sound. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, it's pretty metaphorical, I guess, and a little abstract, but like, like would you say that that kind of describes the music? That though? describes them very well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they always have snippets of some of some things that kind of like I mean we didn't grow up in the seventies of course but yeah. like uh, but I mean it's is it still nostalgic feeling for you this music though yeah yeah like Very well. and to me too right even though I can't really place why but mm -hmm. it just has this good childhood feeling to it it does yeah yeah a and, lot of their and uh, nature feeling too. yeah a lot of their music has like lots of energy which uh, especially this album. It, it kind of starts more slow and drawn out, but then uh, throughout, like later on in the in uh, music has the right to children, it gets more energy. Starting at Roy G. Biv, which is like the most accessible song in the album, oh, yeah. and uh, I think that really helps the album to make it like a much better album because of the, that uh, point in the album structure. Because like just having that, because it's such a long album. It's a sixteen song album or seventeen if you add uh, a Happy bonus cycling. track, Happy Cycling, and. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a really long album. It's about an hour or more than an hour. It's like, it's like seventy minutes. Yeah, seventy minutes. Yeah, and but it keeps it stays interesting the whole time just because of the fact that 
it uh, gets more energetic near the end. So well, and because Boards of Canada does something kind of interesting and unique with their albums is that they have, you know, they have like the regular feature tracks, right? Which are like usually like four to six minutes, right? And then they have vignettes that split up the album and break it up more to. Yeah, I think I, I kind of uh, envision the structure of the albums as like some type of fruit salad. <laughs> how you have all these really good fruits, but you need other fruits to break it up, to make it so you're not just eating the same fruit over and over again, and it complements the others. That's a really good analogy. Um, like for example, this album has, I think it has at least on every side of a vinyl, right? If we're gonna talk in terms of vinyl. Uh, it has like w at least one vignette on each side. So it kind of yeah. breaks up every side of the album, which is very nice. Um, I think this album and Geo Gaddy, the second album, have the most vignettes, mm -hmm. and then they started to move away from that a little bit. Yeah. But, are there any uh, favorite tracks for you? Oh, I guess I should keep this in front of me. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I mean, like I wouldn't say this album's like equal the whole way through. I have some highlights for sure, uh, such as I still like Roy G. Biv a lot. Uh, I really like Turquoise Hexagon Sun. It's sixty ten. Uh, I really like Aquarius. I think Happy Cycling, which is not on here because it's not on the vinyl. It's yeah. only on the CD. It's the only bad thing about the vinyl. Yeah, but I think it, I think it's actually a really good statement to end the album with. Uh, with one very important thought, because it's kind of talking about how it's not like a real thing that happened, but um, they like took it from some other band program, and uh, yeah. So what's ha what the big point is for that song is it's saying that it was like people, it was people complaining about about like loud music or something like that. Yeah, and, and then, then shut down a venue, and it's like protect your constitutional rights and listen to whatever you like. Exactly, <laughs> and uh, so I think that's a really good thing uh, to end the album with instead of happy cycling, because it's kind of like saying, yeah, they were shut down, their music was shut down, and now it's done. Yeah, and then the album's over. Yeah. But I mean, but happy cycling is a really, really it great It is a really good song. Yeah. And, and I, that, I would say that's one of my favorites on the album. It has a great build-up, for sure. Um, yeah, okay, so let's now... Oh, and one more favorite on this yeah. album is Open the Light. Oh, I think that that yes. song really fits like a Dungeons & Dragons or a role-playing type of mood, like, so perfectly. That, the nostalgia of playing like uh, Adventure Quest Worlds and stuff when I was young, <laughs> come back so much although the music in that game is completely different it comes back a lot um, whenever i listen to that it's song a fantasy so. like feeling exactly song, open the lake yeah um yeah i think we're basically done talking about this album yeah we should mention one more thing though um despite the album having this nice kind of like warm nostalgic feeling there are some darker tones with the album too right like a lot of the synths kind of have like yeah, this I darker said, I said, undercurrent yeah. I think you mentioned that. Yeah. But especially like this track that we're having right now, it's a little vignette called um, The Color of the Fire. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of creepy because, because of like the child's voices and stuff. They do that a lot in their music, which is kind of a thing. But um, for their last two albums, they kind of stopped doing that because they didn't want to be known as the electronic band that that has that every album. That, that has child sample vocals and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's move on to... Geo Gaddy, which is their second album. Yeah. So it's, uh, well, I think it's my favorite album by the band. I mean, they're all very I much think, equal, but I think that it, uh, it is really, really well structured, has a really cool feel, but I do like all of their albums just like exactly equally. I think they're all tier ones, so. All right. Yeah. Um, but this album is like, it has more child's voices and uh, than the last. And also it has this very like orangey, hazy feel to it. It's really uh, like the album cover represents, because uh, I didn't want to mention the album covers. Like, yeah. too bad we don't have it on vinyl. We can't like physically show it, but you guys can look it up. It's like a an orange kaleidoscope picture. A kaleidoscope, not only like it's, it's, I guess yeah, it's a kaleidoscope. But uh, what's interesting is what's in it, right? You can see that there's actually like trees and people holding hands, <laughs> right? So the album actually is quite dark. Yeah. Like, when is. we first listened to it, like we didn't really notice that. We were like, oh, the album's just yeah. Just the first time like I listened like to it, the children. The first time I listened to it was when I was biking. And I was like, oh, this is a really good, nice, energetic album. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's not that. You what well, you should nice. do one time is listen to it in the dark. Like, really? when you're uh, going to bed or something like that. Like, when you're falling asleep. It's really, really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a period in the album, about halfway through... Where it where, just ticks. Where it just gets super dark. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow, this is really creepy stuff. Uh, and that period of the album, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's yeah. basically, um, the devil is in the details... A is to B is B is to C or whatever, yeah. that section of the album, yeah. going into Dawn Chorus. Oh, and even past that, like Over the Horizon Radar. Yeah. Actually, that's a nice But track. also, but uh, what's, what's this, hold on, what's this song called near the end of the album? It, it, uh, I'll just look it up as yeah. we talk. Um, but also, uh, Beware the Friendly Stranger, which is like, I think the third, or second or third song, yeah. 
and uh, that song, which is actually like featured in um, Salad Fingers, Salad Fingers, and that's like the main theme song, which is <laughs> like actually really cool. Um, because he used a lot of good music, like electronic music, in his David Firth. Shout out, it, but, shout out to David Firth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, in that, it's like one of the creepiest songs I know. It's it's so good though. So that's that's one uh, example of an earlier song in the album being dark. Uh, you could feel the sky. Oh yeah. It's a really creepy track near just the very end of the album. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and like basically the first half of the album isn't as creepy as the second half, I'd yeah. say. Uh, and the second half is way more ambient too. Yeah. But uh, the whole album structures very very well. It's the whole album is more ambient than than uh, the first. Like, yeah. Than music as to children. Quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, oh, and when it has percussion, which is mostly in the first half, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more like creepy sounding. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot more mechanical and unnat and not human. Really. Yeah. Uh, or that's, yeah. <laughs> that's actually something to note because uh, in uh, music has the right to children. The first half is more drawn out, and the mm -hmm. second half is more energetic. But in uh, Geo Gaddy, it's the complete opposite. The first yeah. half is more energetic. The second half is more drawn out and creepy. Something I want to specifically go into though on that album is the song Gyroscope, because I absolutely love that song. Yeah, uh, it's near the beginning of the album, and the percussion is very repetitive. It's just kind of like this, like you know, rotating, clicking kind mm -hmm. of percussion, right? Uh, you used a really good metaphor for earlier. How it's like uh, I forget what you said. It was something, something like a bunch of sand turning around a, a wheel or something. Well, it's yeah, like the percussion is just endlessly tumbling, mm -hmm. but then like stops and continues. Yeah, and there's like this creepy child's voice counting to nine. Or <laughs> counting yeah. a bunch of like other and it's it's very yeah. very unsettling and like the sense everything's like backwards sounds yeah. backtracked in that song it's just a very very haunting experience and it's like near the beginning of the album but at the same time as it being haunting it's actually still a really nice listen oh so. yeah it's one of my favorite tracks most of that's how most of boards of canada <laughs> well but especially this album because yeah. this album's like actually if you if you listen to it more seriously like you notice there's a lot of weird dark mm -hmm. stuff. and uh the darkness of the albums also really uh plays into the re-listenability of the album. Oh yeah. Because there's like, most, if, if it didn't have that, you'd probably get over the albums quite a bit faster. So. I also want to mention that uh, com comparing Geo Gaddy to Music Has the Right to Children, Music Has the Right to Children is actually a lot simpler in like instrumentation and you know, how much is, how much detail is in each track. Yeah. The the level of like attention to detail and complexity in Geo Gaddy is actually like really huge. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when we were on our trip and I, we listened to Geo Gaddy and then right afterwards we listened to Music Has Right to Children. I remember thinking these are a lot like nicer songs, but there's actually not as much going on as there was in Geo Gaddy. Mm -hmm. So that's why Geo Gaddy is a little inaccessible. Yeah, that's why, that's also why uh, you shouldn't. If you're gonna try to get into Boards of Canada, don't get into this album first. Actually, probably get into this album last out of all their albums. Yeah, so. definitely check out Music Has the Right to Children first, or mm -hmm. Campfire Head Phase. No, I'd say Music Has the Right to Children. Yeah, but th those are both the more yeah. accessible ones. Uh, so I think that's all for Geo Gaddy. Yeah. Um, let's go into the third album. Or should we go into the EP? Sure. Yeah. The EP actually came out before Geo Gaddy, oh, but okay. we we should talk about it. Yeah. Uh, there's a, they have an EP that's really notable, and it's called In a Beautiful Place Out in the Country. I'll explain this. Um, it has a very purple and yellow feel to it, and I think it's a four-song EP. Mm -hmm. It's pretty ambient, Ooh. pretty repetitive, but it's really, really amazing. And it's I'd say it's on par with all their albums. So that's yeah, yeah. yeah if, like I consider it just to be yeah, pretty much as good as the rest of the albums. Like, Except it is way shorter, so there's way less like substance there. But but yeah, like uh, it, it sounds different than Music Has Right to Children. But it sounds yeah. like a step forward from that, like into the direction of mm -hmm. Geo Gaddy and stuff like that. Still have the samples. Yeah. But they have a lot of like very colorful and bright synths. Yeah. The title track is amazing, one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. And then the, it, it ends on like a very, very repetitive ambient track with like these like bright synths that kind of like wash and repeat. Yeah. It's very, very relaxing, very nice. And we listened to this album while driving through uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan and it fit very, very well. So it was in the evening too. Yeah. It's very nice. The sunset. Yeah. I think it was yeah. like perfect fit. Because that's a, it's a little bit of a darker EP, right? Yeah. I'd say. Um, all right, so now going into very different territory for the band, and that's Campfire Headface. So what's what do you say is so different about Campfire Headface, their third album? Well, for one thing, this is the point where they stopped using samples, or I think they have like one or two samples yeah, in it, but they, they don't use very many samples um, in this album. And also, it's they use lots of guitar. This is where they started using making it more like electronic rock rather than just rock, which is something that I do in more than, my Rather music. than just electronic. Yeah, rather, yeah. <laughs> Um, which is something that I've also done in my music, which is Quatra Eyes. There you showed out. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I think that it's a really cool step forward. 
like for example, Dave Van Cowboy or uh, Peacock Tail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, those two songs have really, really good guitar jams and stuff. So, well, they always have like in those in a lot of songs on that album, they have like some kind of like very wobbly and kind of like you know, um, like almost countryish sounding electric guitar. Yeah, but it's not bad country. Country yeah. is usually pretty bad. So. <laughs> well, they do it very well. Um, yeah, but it has like this kind of like uh, very like chill kind of like. Um, I don't know. It's like an, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a clean guitar, but it's like very, very nice guitar. I'd say it's clean. Yeah. Because like by knowing, like I play guitar, right? And if you go on the amp or the pedal, um, it shows clear. It like it's on the clean setting, okay. and if it's perfectly for that. So. All right. Yeah. And so usually they have like some kind of guitar melody or, or hook, and they mm -hmm. they have loop it, right? Yeah. And so you know, a very notable example is the, the first like track or first song on the album. Yeah. Uh, what was that called? Uh, again, uh, Chroma Key Dream. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Uh, amazing, amazing track, and it has like this great, very memorable guitar part. Mm -hmm. Same with Dave and Cowboy, uh, Peacock Tail. Not as much guitar, but it does have a guitar in that song. Yeah, but yeah, like they kind of have a different style. Uh, a lot of the rhythms are maybe are less um, inaccessible, <laughs> They're more accessible, more uh, straightforward on this album. Uh, there's a lot more very bright and kind of very hazy at, uh, ambience very hazy mm -hmm. um as the name states the campfire head phase You're right yeah like phase uh, when well, you know not haze it's head phase, yeah but still pretty close but also a space you'd be in when you're like kind of like really enjoying yourself yeah. out while you're on a camping trip or... and the song farewell fire it fits perfectly the, like the name of that song fits really really perfectly and it fits the album like amazingly although it is really long and at first listen, you get bored, but I think I think it's the it is the longest the track mood of it. Yeah, it's the mood of it that makes it really amazing. And th this album kind of has a similar structure, kind of to Geo Gaddy, I'd yeah. say, because uh, it it does have a more upbeat first half, mm -hmm. and then the second half really goes into even more than Geo Gaddy. It goes into a lot of long ambience. You should, I'll you flip it. Yeah, um, but yeah, they they really do um, make it so that. Like, the, the feel of the album, the color of the album is very, very similar to that of uh, Music Has a Right to Children. Though I think it's mm -hmm. more dark green and more forest-like than... Uh, and it's actually, comparatively, Music Has a Right to Children is a darker album it in is. many ways. Camp of Hair Phase is definitely their most, like, upbeat and kind of happy mm -hmm. feel-good album. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I listened to it. I don't know if you listened to it at this time, but we went on, a, like, a hiking trip, and this was in, in Alberta. Yeah. Uh climbing up Sulphur Mountain. Yeah. I and uh, yeah, I did actually listen to it. Campfire Head Phase is the perfect album for hikes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely recommend it. So, uh, yeah. Well, especially hikes with forest. If it's like a mountain hike, like a, or mountain hikes are good, but if it's like a really rocky hike, that's not, it doesn't fit that well. But. It's got, yeah, with a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, anyway, favorite tracks? Oh, man. No, I don't have any. I think it's really equal. Okay. I think the whole al album as a whole is just... So. I, I don't definitely don't think so. Uh, I think that I definitely have highlights on this one, but uh, yeah, de definitely Chroma Key, Dreamcoat, Peacock Tail, Dave and Cowboy is very beautiful. Um, the last Macquarie Ridge is really good. Well, yeah, Macquarie Ridge is really good. Also, I really like Sherbet Head. It's kind of more of a mm -hmm. vignette. Uh, and my, probably my favorite track is Oscar's See Through Red Eye. That's a good one. Yeah. Love it. Okay, so now let's go on to their fourth album. So this is after quite a while of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, was this album was released. Yeah. I wish I was a fan at the time, because I'm sure the fan base was very excited when they announced that they were going to release a new album yeah. and dropped the single Reach for the Dead. Yeah, but this is uh, this album is called Tomorrow's Harvest. It has a very like cold, uh, wintry, post-apocalyptic type of mood to it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I did not drink any water there. I, I <laughs> no. But yes, Gone is the the feelings of blissful childhood nostalgia and, a fr and, a, and instead is like this kind of like bleak futuristic mm -hmm. kind of cold vibe and it's very nice mm -hmm. well it's there's even a song dark. called um <laughs> well song palace called... posse i think fits this this mood the best but there's a song called cold something cold earth cold earth yeah and that that's nothing is real <laughs> yeah Reach for the Dead. It's all like very bleak. It is, yeah. Yeah, and also the name Tomorrow's Harvest and how they have like the album cover, which with like the city in the distance and yeah. like very like you know kind of like flat colors. Also like the fog in the in the horizon. Yeah, like it's it's very eerie, very cool, and definitely fits the long drive through the plains of Saskatchewan. Yeah. I'd <laughs> say this uh, album is 
equally as dark as GeoGaddy, except for in a different way. In a different way. Yeah. It's more like, uh, I don't know, it's more like cold and dark, while GeoGaddy is like warm and dark. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also that's dark in like a, a weird, like, like kind of creepy like, way. Instead yeah, like of, a satanic kind of way. And this exactly, is dark in yeah. like a nihilistic kind of way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and so in, in Tomorrow's Harvest, basically, um, the album has vignettes as usual, but they're more just this, like, but they don't feel any different than the rest of the tracks. Yeah, they don't. Normally in the other albums, the vignettes feel like just short tracks that kind of like, yeah, interludes. But in this album, they feel like their own songs, mm -hmm. but it doesn't break up the album. It actually, it actually really helps the structure of the album to be more, to keep it, keep your interest the whole time. It is a shorter album, right? Uh, I think it's the same length as the rest. Really? It does feel a little shorter. I it does feel say. a lot shorter. But it has 18 tracks on it, or 17 tracks on it, so it's just the same as the... I think Geo Gaddy has the most tracks. Yeah. Oh, and also, we never talked with, with Geo Gaddy, just for, for, for kicks. They uh, had a track that was four minutes long called Magic Window. Oh, yeah. And just to it, make it so it's the album is uh, six, 66, 66 minutes. minutes and 60 and six, six seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So for the for the six 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 stuff yeah. and so, Magic Window is just a silent track. There's nothing. There's no like um, instruments in it or anything. Yeah, it's just complete silence. But just to you know bring out the, uh, the the album length. But if you have the CD version with the bonus track, you have the song uh, from All Things One Source at the end. Yeah, and, so that, and that's that like kids. That. Yeah, but that's like uh, little. That song has little kids talking about what they think God is. Yeah, and it's like he's I, a I, big fat man <laughs> in outer space. It's great, yeah. but like I read this one, this one opinion on that, and that was that like it's almost like that's the exorcism of the album. <laughs> all the demons throughout the album. It's like at the very end they have that like, uh, to exercise yeah. all of it. It's great. And also to uh, <laughs> exercise the fact that it's like six 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 or whatever. Yeah, and that too. It actually yeah. breaks. The, it ruins that six six six. Thing. And yeah. also having Magic Window makes it so that is like a rightful bonus track at mm -hmm. the end of Silence. It does. Anyway, so back to uh, Tomorrow's Harvest, just what we were talking about. Um, so yes, the vignette type tracks do feel just as complete as the other ones. So, for example, Gemini, the first track on the album, yeah. is really, really good. It has kind of these twists and turns, and very just establishes a very cool atmosphere, right? It does. Reach and then the Reach Dead. for the Dead is right after that, which establishes the atmosphere even more. Reach for the Dead is one of the best Forza of Canada songs, yeah. I think. I think it's great build. Yeah, I'd awesome say it's up synths. there. Yeah, it's, oh, it's so good. Uh, it, like, it's, it's something that you'd play... Uh, it's like some. It's like music that you have as a soundtrack to like an eighties like sci-fi movie or something. Yeah, like that. a lot great. of this album is very sci-fi. Yeah, uh, and also if you've seen the movie or the the TV show Stranger Things, I think Tomorrow's Harvest actually like yeah. really fits. Like Come to Dust fits very very well for that. Yeah, like there's a lot of music in Stranger Things that actually like kind of reminded me of Tomorrow's Harvest and that, mm -hmm. that sound. That's one. That's actually one uh, part of Stranger Things that made me enjoy the show more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, great soundtrack for that show, too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely some Boards of Canada vibes, too. So yeah, uh, Tomorrow's Harvest kind of has this very cold-sounding percussion, unlike the rest of their albums, mm -hmm. right? Uh, same with the synths. The synths, synths sound a lot more kind of, like, dead. Right? I wouldn't say that they have the dark undertone that the others have. They don't, no. Yeah, I'd say they have, like, a, usually some color as the undertone. They, they sound a lot more flat. They do. Yeah. Which is, like, what they wanted to come yeah. for the sound. Um, also, we should talk about, there's one track on there called Transmissions Pharaoh, I think it's called, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like some person like, you know, saying like some, some numbers again, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, a, a very deep kind of like similar to telepath, manipulated kind different. of voice. Yeah. Uh, and so they kind of do bring back some samples for mm -hmm. this album that were kind of not on Campfire Headface, yeah. but they're not child voices no, anymore. They're, <laughs> they're usually like, you know, creepy sound and like adult voices or something mm -hmm. like that. So shows that they kind of changed as artists. So I really kind of, you know, interested in what they release mm -hmm. next. I kind of respect them for that instead mm -hmm. of just going with what's easy. Yeah, they didn't go back to their sound that they were mm -hmm. familiar with. They kind of like, in the in that year they grew as artists. <laughs> in those years they grew yeah. as artists. It was basically. one year. No. Yeah, <laughs> it was like eight years. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so basically that's it. Uh, we, we talked about the four main Boards of Canada albums and their most popular EP. Yeah. Oh, and what is uh, what are some favorite tracks on come, uh, Tomorrow's come Harvest? Harvest? I mean, other than Reach for the Dead, which I already mentioned, definitely Come to Dust and New Seeds and Cold Earth. New Seeds is amazing. Yeah. It's one of the best tracks they've made. Oh, it is, totally. Yeah. So, uh, and Palace Posey is really good, too. I think I think it's a really equal album. Yeah. I find I, I really, like, I enjoy all their albums from start to finish. Yeah. They really know how to structure them. Well. I say that all their albums, not, not the EP, but all their albums are tier ones. The EP would probably be tier two. 
Yeah. I probably wouldn't say all their albums are tier one. I'd probably say GeoGaddy would be like a very close tier one. But I'd say that like I have a maybe more stricter definition of tier one than you. I have a very strict <laughs> definition of it, but I love these albums a lot. Yeah, so do I. I think Boards of Canada are probably my top five artists. Mm-hmm. I'd so. say yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Are we done with Boards of Canada? I think. Yeah. So uh our next video very likely will be Arcade Fire. Yeah. So we'll be discussing the whole uh, discography of Arcade Fire and um, also as we said in our intro in our channel intro um, remember to well if you really want us to talk about an album then yeah just put it in the comments and we'll most likely try to get into it it'll probably be about a month before or three months or so (laughs) but still we probably will so it's yeah, yeah, and feel free to, to, you know, share your opinions about Boards of Canada on this video. Yeah. And if you have any friends that you think, like, really enjoy this album, send this video to them, because I'm sure they enjoy it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Alright, thanks for watching. Yeah. Bye. Wow. Again?